All right, hello, and thank you for joining us today for the final stop on this year's historic Artist Homes and Studios virtual road trip. We have trekked across much of the US this summer, delving into the remarkable spaces and stories of six artists, Orton Escherwick, Ann Norton, St. Ohm, Georgia O'Keeffe, and No Purifoy. And today we wrap up this road trip with the original cowboy artist, C.M. Russell. This presentation series is a collaboration between the James Castle House and Boise, Idaho, and the Historic Artist Homes and Studios Program, also referred to as Haas. For those of you just learning about Haas, this is a program of the National Trust for Historic Preservation and is a coalition of 55 sites across 25 states. Um, all these sites were previously the homes and working studios of many American artists. Haas aims to preserve the nation's legacy of creativity in the visual arts by connecting visitors with these amazing spaces. My name is Mackenzie Dunstan, and I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator at the James Castle House in Boise, Idaho, located on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Shoshone, Bannock, and Northern Paiute people. With me today is Valerie Blent, the Director of Haas. And from the C.M. Russell Museum, Olivia Cotterman, Assistant Curator, and Christina Horton, Direction, our Communications Officer. American Sign Language Interpretation is being provided by Lavona Andrew. Along with ASL interpretation, English language captions are available by clicking on the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen and then selecting show subtitle. So live transcript, show subtitle. Uh, we strongly encourage your questions and comments through, uh, throughout the presentation today, so please send all of those through the Q&A box and we will answer as many as we possibly can at the end of today's presentation. This event is also being recorded and will be made available online in the coming weeks. And at the end of this presentation, we will also share um, follow-up links to related events, resources, and mailing lists. So because this is a virtual road trip, if I could have my next slide, please. Um, I would love to offer a few travel notes for us to consider before we get started. So last month, we visited the Noah Purifoy Desert Art Museum in Joshua Tree, California. To reach the C.M. Russell Museum in Great Falls, Montana, we'll have to traverse over 1,200 miles. So if you were to do this trip in real life, you want to plan for at least four days of travel. So from California, we're gonna head northeast and we'll briefly stop in Las Vegas, Nevada to wander the Neon Museum. You can take a tour of this space after sunset and see many of the iconic neon displays from Las Vegas's golden age lit up across this three acre outdoor site. If you do choose to spend some time in a casino, um, very tempting, uh, do keep your eyes peeled for the art o -Mat machines which are refurbished retro uh, cigarette vending machines that now dispense tiny uh, original artworks rather than a pack of smokes. So once you have your miniature souvenir in hand, continue toward Utah. You'll pass both Zion National Park and Bryce Canyon National Park along the way. And honestly, choosing between these two amazing and awe-inspiring landscapes is nearly impossible. Um, whichever you do choose, though, uh, a kaleidoscope of crimson, pink, and rust-colored sandstone in the forms of spires and canyons will certainly not disappoint as you explore either on foot or by horseback. So as you continue north, it might sound strange to list a library as a road trip attraction, but the Salt Lake City Public Library is truly a modern work of architectural art. Take a break from the road and enjoy a few quiet hours wandering the multi-level library campus that features rooftop gardens, shops, plenty of reading nooks, and of course, books galore. Crossing into Idaho, I would encourage a detour just a few hours westward to Boise to experience the James Castle House. Rooted in James, Ca James Castle's sense of wonder and discovery, the house today is a center for contemporary and historical exhibitions, tours, performances, talks, and residency programs. It is a very special place, but I might be a little biased. Uh, there is much to see once you finally arrive in Montana. So before we reach our final destination, I'd like to invite Valerie to share some of her recommendations when traveling in this area. 
Thank you, Mackenzie, to you and everyone involved at the James Castle House for spearheading this virtual road trip in collaboration with Historic Artists Films and Studios. I'm excited to have, uh, to have us include this year's series with a site I had the pleasure of visiting my very first year that I came to Haas. I was honored to be invited to participate in a colloquium to discuss plans for the restoration and reinterpretation of the home and studio. And over the course of three days, myself and my other invited colleagues were graciously hosted and treated and frankly wined and dined to a live art auction gala, barbecue luncheon on museum grounds and the preview screening of a new documentary on Russell all while taking in the home and studio, which make up one of the oldest known preserved artist homes in the nation almost 100 years ago. I was introduced to what I was immediately told was the Westerners Western painter and the singular terrain that makes up this part of the country. While you can travel by car, as we promote here on the road trip, I chose to make my trip um, via air and via Denver where one can also stop at the preserved studio of artist and teacher Vance Kirkland, albeit um, a very different site and artist than Russell, to be sure. And while major collections of Russell's works can be seen in Helena and at the Buffalo Bill Center in Wyoming, the Denver Museum of Art also provides an opportunity to see works such as In the Enemy's Country and Buffalo Hunt. But mostly, I recommend this route as it allows for a two plus an hour nonstop flight directly into Great Falls. In one of the smallest commercial jets I have ever been in, affording sublime mountain views and an arresting aerial approach into the city that I guarantee you are never going to forget. I certainly have not. It gives you an immediate sense of why Russell would set up in this burgeoning suburb to foster his career and family life, while also building a log cabin studio out of recycled telephone poles among his neighbors. Today, your experience is enriched further by the impressive purpose-built museum on campus, where you can not only learn about Russell, but about the art, culture, history, and indigenous peoples of this region. And the opportunity to visit this site as part of my brand new job <laughs> produced the same sensory thrill that I am privileged to experience time and again in this work and which awaits all of you. Of course, the namesake of this city is centered in a series of waterfalls encountered by Lewis and Clark in 1805 on their famous expedition to explore the Louisiana Purchase. Today, the extant canyon walls show the arduous tax they had of um, portaging around the falls. Arriving, Captain Lewis proclaimed this the grandest sight I ever beheld. While today, the Ryan Dam is one of five dams that control the river flow, the enormity of the falls is still impressive at 148 feet. The best viewing is from the highest peak at Ryan Island Park, which is accessed from a suspension bridge across the Missouri River. Once there, picnic on park grounds or reserve the historic clubhouse free of charge for a more substantial gathering or personal soiree. It's equipped with a full kitchen and reception hall. Travel upstream a bit where Crooked Falls flows over an irregular shelf and then further still to Rainbow Falls, styled the beautiful Cascade by Lewis. Nearest to city limits is Black Eagle Falls. But the falls themselves are just the exquisite centerpiece in a series of engaging outdoor experiences to have here. Go walking, running, or biking along the River's Edge Trail, which follows the riverbank for miles, connecting many of Great Falls signature natural attractions, including glimpses of the falls throughout. A great place to start is Gibson Park, which features extensive flower gardens punctuated by serene fountains and reflecting pools. Make sure to visit Giant Springs State Park. It's home to the largest freshwater spring in the country. Its unique geological features make it a favorite for photographers, and it is the perfect place for picnicking, hiking, biking, and fishing. And of course, whether you are a fan of Lewis and Clark or not, you cannot miss the Lewis and Clark Interpretive Center, also found along the trail and just nine minutes from the Russell Museum. Through an impressive two-story diorama, learn about the arduous 18-mile portage of the explorers. And outside the center, you can walk the interpretive trails following the path of Lewis and Clark. Russell completed many images related to the expedition, including his expansive mural, 
Lewis and Clark meeting the Indians at Ross Hole, which hangs in the Capitol building in Helena. The trail also provides direct access to downtown, where more diversions await. Stop off at the town visitor center and pick up a map that provides a self-guided tour of the rich and varied architecture, including the city's lower north side, the second oldest and grandest neighborhood in town. Marvel at the eight arched concrete 10th Street Bridge spanning the river at more than 1,000 feet and built in Russell's own lifetime. Now looking for some respite and libation, Great Falls boasts a strong brewery scene or stop as we did when our hosts from the Russell took us to the world famous Sip and Dip featured in GQ magazine. A mainstay since the 1960s, this tiki bar is a once in a lifetime experience to be sure as I can personally attest. We sang along to Sweet Caroline as longtime fixture Pat played the organ sipped colorful and formidable cocktails, all while watching mermaids swim in the pool behind the back glass wall of the bar. Many of these young ladies, and sometimes young men, swim for their local swim team. If you need a souvenir, purchase the rubber ducky, as Haas Advisory Chair Wanda Korn did. Still can't get enough of this place. The bar and restaurant are part of the O'Hare Motor Inn, so you can stay over and actually get a complimentary dock in your own room. After a night of revelry, set out throughout the city and find the more than 20 beautifully painted fiberglass bison that grace indoor and outdoor locales, such as the airport, the local university, and of course, the Russell Museum. If you wanna learn about the indigenous trip they were like before Lewis and Clark arrived, visit the First People's Buffalo Jump State Park. Located about 20 miles west of the city, 20 minutes, excuse me, west of the city, this park is an archaeological site believed to be one of the largest ancient buffalo jump sites in America. Indigenous people would use the cliff formation as part of their hunting tactic to herd, hunt, and kill plains bison in mass quantities. The park also has an extensive education center with exhibits, or you can part partake in a traditional storytelling circle, and outside an amphitheater and fields for playing traditional games away. One of the amazing features of Russell Works are his representation of singular landscape features that define this part of the country, like his own rendition of a buffalo jump seen at the top left on the screen. Numerous works also highlight buttes, flat-topped steel, steep-sided towers of rock created through the erosion of elevated plains by water, wind, and ice. Montana Booth's 11 square buttes, two of the most prominent, are actually fairly close to Great Falls and are featured in Russell Works. Both are worth a drive to see. Just at half hour southwest is the one in Cascade County, featured in Charlie M. Russell and his friends in the collection of the Montana Historical Society. And about an hour and 15 minutes east of Great Falls is the Square View, which can be seen in the Tenderfoot in the collection of the Sid Richard Museum in Fort Worth, Texas. These massive geological features set against the big sky of this region are a marvel for those of us traveling from other parts of the country. Russell, of course, is synonymous with the sweeping Montana landscape and experiencing all these linkages firsthand is one of the pure joys of visiting here. Great Falls played a pivotal role, but the other key locale throughout his life and career was his cabin in the western part of Glacier National Park, a retreat where he and his wife hosted friends, family, and fellow artists. Perhaps the artist's most favorite place in the world to get a true sense of Charlie, his life, and his work, you should make a pilgrimage to this park. But please bank in enough time in your travel plans for this visit, as it is a four-hour journey in both directions. Known as the crown of the continent, there are more than one million acres here, offering more than 700 miles for hiking, a showcase of melting glaciers, alpine meadows, carved valleys, and spectacular lakes. Travel the going to the sun road, designated as a historic civil engineering landmark. This approximately 50 mile road bisects the park, crossing the continental divide, and is one of the best ways to experience panoramic vistas 
communing with what was so inspiring to Russell. All these aspects and focal points for Russell's life and work come together at the site. I'm thrilled we will conclude this series with another artist who displayed talents in so many areas, painter, illustrator, sculptor, author, and activist for native rights. Um, even his signature is a work of art, as you see on screen. A complex person who set up in town, but whose heart forever remained in the wilderness, a passion he was able to capture for all of us in his art, a self-made man aided by his equally talented wife, who served as his business manager, initially selling works out of their dining room in a home she helped design. I love that this site has given agency and amplified her story through their reinterpretation. There are so many layers here and our hosts, Christina and Olivia will help introduce them to us all. I thank them and of course you Mackenzie for providing a wonderful cap off to a season of entrancing virtual journeys. Thank you so much, Valerie. I always love to hear your travel notes. It makes me wanna get in the car and go right now. Um, but we're here to learn about CM Russell. So I will now pass this off to Christina and Olivia to share more about this wonderful artist. Thank you so much, Denai. I was gonna make a joke about, well, that was great. Thanks for joining us. Valerie did it all and <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, well, before we get started, we would of course like to acknowledge that uh, the CM Russell Museum and Great Falls are situated on land traditionally inhabited by the Blackfeet, Crow, Assiniboine and Metis people, as well as multiple other tribes who um, occupied the plains throughout history. So the CM Russell Museum, we're so glad that you all joined us. My name is Christina Horton. I am the communications officer here at the uh, museum. And this is- My name is Olivia Cotterman and I am the assistant curator. And we will be sort of tag teaming the presentation today. Uh, so we wanted to kind of orient you with our space a little bit. So on your screen, you're seeing two aerial views of the museum. The first, uh, sh this is looking south with um, east, of course, being to the left. Uh, we have a beautiful new lawn that we just installed recently, and that allowed us to expand our sculpture garden that we have out front. So when people first arrive at the museum, we are located in a neighborhood, <clears throat> excuse me, because we are uh, on the same property that Charlie and Nancy once lived. So they arrive in the neighborhood, uh, they're greeted by this beautiful lawn, our wonderful sculpture garden, and then once they go into the main building here, they are able to pass through it and out the back or the south end and visit C.M. Russell's original studio, which I'm highlighting with my mouse here, and his home, which is to the left. The home was moved in the 1970s about 70 feet to the east, uh, so it originally was kind of under where these trees are that you see here, um, but that is the only uh, real change that was made to the location of either structure. They are both located on 4th Avenue North, which is the street you'll see here, and Olivia will tell you a little bit about, uh, more about that in a moment. So speaking of, Olivia, would you like to introduce them to Charlie and tell them a little bit about him? Of course. So Charlie was born March 19th, 1864. Um, he had four brothers and one sister. Now his grandparents, um, the Bent family, so Lucy Bent and Charles Bent actually were frontiersmen and they helped establish um, Bent Fort, which is in present day Colorado. The Russell family had the Oak Hill Estate, um, which would eventually turn into the Parker Russell Mining and Manufacturing Company. And growing up, Charlie always had a fascination with the West. He was determined to be a cowboy. Um, and so they had a family friend, the Russells, that were actually coming to Montana. And his parents thought, you know what, we'll send him with, with this friend and he'll get the itch out of his way and realize how hard it is to actually be a cowboy. Now we know that that didn't necessarily happen and Charlie did stay in Montana. When he moved to Montana, he was just 16 years old and he began his career as a sheep herder. He wasn't very good at it. He lost a lot of his sheep um, because he was busy painting and sketching and drawing. So he gets fired and eventually is kind of down on his luck, doesn't necessarily know what to do. Um, and a man named Jake Hoover kind of comes in and takes him under his wing. And he becomes a night wrangler, which is the perfect job for Charlie because he could paint and draw during the day and then do his job at night. 
Now, Charlie technically didn't have any formal art training. He did attend art school when he only lasted about three days. And he did actually attend military school in New Jersey, but he had a learning disability called dysgraphia. So he could read and understand the information, but he had a hard time formulating it and putting it down on paper. Um, it would take him a really long time just to be able to write a sentence or form a letter. So um, when he came out here, um, it was really interesting for him. It was a different time, right? So because he didn't have any formal art training, he was still a prolific artist and he used his travels with Nancy to kind of engage with other artists and become um, better at his craft. So during his career, he actually painted and did over 4,000 works of art. Um, and he would eventually meet Nancy in 1895, which I'll get into her in just a second. Oopsies. There we go. <laughs> so Nancy actually was born in Kentucky in 1878 to a tobacco farmer. Um, her stepdad, James Allen, and her mom and her half-sister all moved out to Montana in hopes of finding gold. Um, her stepfather would continue on westward and the three women stayed in Montana. Her mother did um, unfortunately become pretty ill and she did, she did pass. Um, so her stepfather came to retrieve her half-sister Ella and left Nancy to her own devices um, and she was just 16 years old. So she kind of had to figure out and navigate her way um, through life. So there was a family with Ben and Layla Roberts that actually hired Nancy um, to be a housekeeper in 1895, which is how Nancy and Charlie would meet. There was talk of a cowboy uh, that was coming for dinner and Nancy obviously was there. And 11 months later, they got married actually in the Roberts home. So Nancy played a really important um, role in Charlie's life. And Charlie was kind of uncomfortable selling his artwork. He would oftentimes give it away and Nancy wasn't necessarily comfortable with that. So she kind of became the business manager and really promoted Charlie's work. And she's the sole reason that he was the highest paid living artist of his time. And now not only did she have a major influence in his artwork, but she also had an influence in the home and studio as well, which I'm gonna to toss it back to Christina to kind of lead you guys into the home. All right. Well, when Charlie and Nancy first married in 1896, they lived in Cascade, which is where the Roberts family lived and where they had met. But they pretty quickly realized if Russell was going to become an artist and a professional artist at that, he needed to have a larger audience. Um, Great Falls was nearby. It's about, excuse me, about 40 miles away. Uh, so they moved to Great Falls bought some land on 4th Avenue North, and then a few years later in 1900, were able to complete the home. So you're looking at the house as it stands today, although it looks very similar to what it did back then. Um, you'll notice we have a little floor plan here. So the front door of the home is located right at the top here. And it's kind of unique in that when you first walk in the front door here, you're in a little entryway and that has two doors from it. So you can walk in and proceed straight into the foyer, or you could turn and go into the parlor right away. The reason they did that is when they first built the house, Charlie created his um, artist studio in this front parlor. It had beautiful Southern light, big windows, um, and there was space for him to keep his artifacts. He had an incredible collection of Native American artifacts, um, pieces from his cowboying days, really things he would look to for inspiration when creating his, his um, pieces of artwork. So people, when they wanted to come visit Charlie, and he was a very popular guy, they could just come in the house and go right into the parlor and not really disturb their home or, um, you know, Nancy's place of work. Her desk was located right here, right inside the front door. Of course, they had a large, beautiful dining room. They did a lot of hosting. They enjoyed having guests. And then if you pass through a small doorway here, you're kind of in the back space of the house. So this is a kitchen. There's a small pantry and maid's quarters. And then, of course, a full bathroom room on this main level. You may notice a change in the flooring. Um, when the home was first built, they used fur for the floors. Um, at some point, oak floors were added to the um, foyer, the parlor, and the dining room. In all of our restoration and conservation work, we don't know exactly when those floors were added. It may have been during the Russell's tenure in the home, and it may have been later. So we decided to keep those oak floors 
partly because they are very, very hard. They're much harder wood than fur. And with the amount of traffic those spaces see from the museum guests, um, it just seemed like the best choice to make. So I'll uh, advance the slide and take us into the house a little bit. So when you first walk in the door, we've now set up Nancy's desk. You can see a historic photo of Nancy sitting at her desk. We did our best to recreate it as best as we could. Um, and what's really fun about this area of the home is there is a button that guests can push and it plays a video here on the blotter of the desk. And it's actually a conversation that happens between Nancy Russell and a buyer named Malcolm McKay. It's all based on letters that were exchanged between the two of them about a painting that the McKay family would be purchasing. So it's a really fun way for guests to interact a little bit, if you will, with Nancy and hear how she talked to people about Russell's artwork, how she negotiated with them, um, how she handled if maybe someone wasn't pleased with a painting, that sort of thing. In the um, parlor or that front room, we set up a little artist area, although after the studio was built, Charlie didn't do any painting in the house itself, but we will talk about the studio here in a few minutes. Um, but we thought it was that was still an important part of the story to tell since he did paint in this space for three to four years um, when they first moved in here. And then we also have a, a nice view of looking from Nancy's desk into the room, so or into the other room. So you'll see to the left there is the parlor and straight ahead is the dining room. I do want to take a quick moment to talk about um, the wallpaper. You'll notice it's very bright and bold. Um, I'll talk more about that in a few minutes, but this was a very conscious decision Nancy made to create these sort of lush, um, kind of luxurious spaces in the public area of the home. So the places that people would be seeing, whereas in the kitchen and in the upstairs where we'll go in a moment, it's much more kind of utilitarian, um, not as um, fancy, if you will. So if you walk up the stairs there next to Nancy's desk, you will, uh, well, actually, as you're walking up the stairs, you will notice that they are incredibly steep. And the reason for that is when Charlie and Nancy purchased the plans for the home, they realized they didn't have quite enough money to build the home as it was in the plans. I don't know about you, I just remodeled my kitchen and you certainly have to change your plans mid, mid, uh, mid project. So they discovered they wouldn't quite have enough budget. So their builder, George Calvert, recommended that they shrink the plans by a seven or by one eighth. So this house is actually a seven eighth scale of the original plans. But the only place you can really tell or feel that is again, when you're walking up those stairs, they're rather narrow and pretty darn steep. I can't imagine walking down them as a woman in this era with the big full skirts, the little, you know, the, the heeled shoes they wore. Um, yeah, it's uh, thankfully they're not very long. So if you did have a stumble, you wouldn't fall too far. But uh, anyway, so you walk up the stairs here. If you turn to the left, um, you have a wonderful little sitting area next to a window. If you walk straight through, this is the bedroom that Charlie mostly um, utilized. Uh, and then this other bedroom was Nancy's room for the most part. Of course, at this time, married couples typically did have separate bedrooms and they were not um, any different in that way. However, living here in Great Falls, Montana, they hosted a lot of friends. Uh, as Valerie mentioned, it is not the easiest place to get to. Now, thankfully, we have airplanes. But back then, it was a long, arduous journey. So people would come and stay for weeks or even months. And in those cases, they would of course share a bedroom and that, excuse me, Charlie and Nancy would share a bedroom. This bedroom would be turned into a guest room. There is a partition here that could be closed off and this could actually become another bedroom on top of that. They also had two additional bedrooms on this level. This back bedroom here uh, was utilized by boarders um, and family friends. So um, Josephine Wright or Josie Wright was a dear family friend. She would um, often come and take care of their son when Charlie and Nancy were traveling. Um, and so this is, this is the room that would be used for that. And then this bedroom here is of course, sweet little Jack's bedroom. Charlie and Nancy had, they were married for nearly 20 years and were never blessed with children of their own. And so they decided to adopt and uh, they ended up with sweet two month old Jack. Uh, one thing I love, one story I love about the, our restoration project of this house is we took paint samples and 
we found that originally this bedroom had been painted blue and it was actually painted blue using exterior house paint. You may remember from a previous slide, the exterior of their house is blue. So what I can only imagine happened and what we hypothesized happened was they found out they would be adopting a young boy. They remembered they had some blue paint left over from the outside of the house and just um, painted his bedroom in that color, which I think is, is really special and lovely. So we'll take a little closer look at the two, or the, excuse me, the rooms upstairs. So this is um, Charlie's bedroom. It was south facing. Again, lots of wonderful, beautiful natural light. Um, this is Josephine Wright's bedroom here, that back bedroom I mentioned. It is pretty small, as you can see, uh, little Jack's bedroom. Uh, the um, landing at the top of the stairs, they had a lovely sitting area. And then they had a water closet upstairs, a toilet and a sink. Uh, and that was the height of technology at the time. They were one of the first houses on the block to have uh, plumbing on the second story, which was pretty cool. So to talk a little bit about the restoration and conservation, um, the house has a really interesting history. It was saved from um, demolition multiple times. And uh, one of the ways it was saved is they decided to allow people to live in the house. So in um, Charlie Russell died in 1926. By 1928, Nancy had made an agreement with the city to sell the house and studio and some property around it uh, with the guarantee that the city would turn the studio into a memorial museum to Charlie Russell, and that opened on July 4th of 1930. But in order for the city to do that, they hired a caretaker who was given a small stipend to oversee the house, or excuse me, the studio, and they were allowed to live in the home rent free. So the home was actually occupied by people um, up until when the museum as we know it today, took it over in the 1960s. So quite some time of people living in it, making their own changes. Uh, as far as we know, there weren't a lot of really great controls over what changes they made. So in 2017, well, this process started quite a bit earlier, but finally in 2017, when we closed the house and studio to um, embark on this project, we, um, <clears throat> had to do quite a few things. One of those being peel away six layers of wallpaper. We didn't know how many layers there would be. Ultimately, we found six. Um, and what our historic architect and wallpaper expert ended up doing was finding sections of the wall that they felt wouldn't have been as badly damaged by UV and natural light. Uh, and they would steam the section and then use an exacto knife and peel away a layer and then do it again over and over and over again so they could conserve a large enough piece that it could be sent away for analysis. That analysis combined with fo historic photographs of the space um, told us that in the parlor area you had this beautiful red hydrangea print and in the foyer near Nancy's desk and up the stairs, you had this beautiful striped green wallpaper. So we had um, some artists recreate a stamp and then bought blank rolls of wallpaper and had them hand stamped to really ensure we had that authentic um, material. Because this was such a long process and there was so much that went into it, we felt it was important to tell the general public why conserving and restoring a over 100 year old home was important, but also how difficult it was. So we did create uh, an interpretive section in the house that talks about what the project was. So people can use these sliding panels here to go back the different layers of wallpaper we removed to get to the original. They can um, talk about, or they can look at these blocks that show different color schemes that chart that Nancy, excuse me, would have chosen. Um, and then we also took the opportunity to tell people about lath and plaster. I'm sure you all are familiar with this because you're you work with historic buildings, but a lot of people today just know about wallboard. Um, and so the lath and plaster was really a struggle for us. Nancy, when building the home very much decided where to spend and where to save. As I mentioned, she created three beautiful spaces with lush, um, rich looking woodwork and wallpaper and furnishings. Um, but then in other places like the kitchen and upstairs, it was a little more um, plain or conservative. Her plaster was another area. So typically plaster is, um, you know, one half to one full inch thick. 
the plaster in the house was only a quarter inch thick. So it was quite thin, uh, which meant over time it degraded and we had to do an incredible amount of plaster stabilization, which if any of you have been through that process, you know it's not simple, but um, that was something we needed to do. And we thought, again, it was important to tell people what that was like. And so we have a little example of what lath and plaster looks like. All right. Okay. Now that we've talked about the house, let's move over to the studio. I'm going to turn it back over to Olivia to talk about the studio. So as Christina mentioned, the first studio um, actually was in the home, which was pretty inconvenient. Um, Charlie would get distracted by Nancy's friends and visitors, and the smell of his paints and the turpentine just became to be too much. Um, and when he first actually moved to Great Falls, he had a studio um, in the back room of the Brunswick Bar, which was actually owned by Albert Trigg, which he became really close with Albert Trigg, and the home and the studio are actually two doors down from the Trigg family home. So um, they have had a really important uh, role in his life. And so because the, the studio and the home just wasn't working anymore, they had the studio built in 1903. Um, and because Charlie moved out here and he had hopes of being a cowboy, um, he really wanted the studio to be a log cabin to remind him of his cowboy days. He would go on to say that I want a log studio someday, just like I used to live in. So it was really important to make sure that that did happen. Um, there was a little hesitancy from Charlie at first, just because as Christina had mentioned, Fourth Avenue North was a really prestigious area of town. Um, and so to put up a log cabin in this area, he was kind of iffy about it. And if it would be a good idea to put something, I guess, not as extravagant as a regular home. Um, so, so no oh no no sorry the original studio if she goes back you want to go back yeah. okay the original studio was just that little square right here um and then they did were working on an expansion um in 1926 so the year that charlie passed a lot of people think that we added that expansion and it's not necessarily the case. Nancy had that finished in 1928, and she really pushed for the studio to be a memorial, um, and that was open to the public in 1930. Now I can move on? Okay. <laughs> so the studio is actually constructed out of Western Red Cedar telephone poles, um, and it was originally um, 24 by 30 inch logs, and the floors actually weren't originally wood, they were concrete pavers. Um, and in 1906, those pavers were replaced with the wood floor. Um, and one of the restoration projects was actually uh, putting the, the studio on a foundation because when they laid the wood floor, it was just right on the ground. So as you can imagine, that's gonna cause some issues um, with the wood. So there also was um, a diamond paver stone that was added in front um, of the studio and it is his signature um, landmark. So. He added, which is kind of hard to see, but Christina can point it out, the back door um, yeah, to the studio. You can't really see it, but no, it's, it's in it's, this corner. <laughs> and it was just easier flow for him to jump from the studio right to the home. They were pretty close. I believe they're only 15 feet apart. Um, so one of the projects for the restoration that happened. So when the memorial opened in 1930, all of the original artifacts um, we're still in the studio. So in 2017, one of the projects was to take those objects, his original objects, and recreate high replicas. So that way those objects could be safer and put into the main museum and just have the humidity control um, and just be better monitored. Because as Christina pointed out to me, um, Montana winters can go to negative 40, and then in the summers, they can be above 100. Um, and at the end of the day, it still is a log cabin, so that temperature fluctuation can really um, cause some damage to the, to the objects. The painting, um, too, that Valerie had mentioned that he was commissioned to paint, which is Lewis and Clark meeting the Indians at Ross's Hole, um, was actually the canvas was too big to fit into the studio. So the studio had to be raised by four logs which I think is fascinating. Christina also briefly mentioned that his studio in the home had a lot of his um, Native American um, objects. And so it just eventually too became too much to have that in the home. So he used the studio to kind of house those objects. And um, he also had his props in there too because he would have people come and model and Josephine Wright um, that Christina had mentioned was one of those models. Um, so it just became 
a really important space to Charlie. Um, so this picture was really important because it kind of shows Charlie and then the reinterpretation and as close to the original studio as we could possibly get. Um, I think that's one of the really neat things about both the home and the studio is they're back to their original original um, positions as much as they possibly can be. So also, Christina kind of mentioned it, the studio hasn't been moved, which I think is also really neat. And the studio was just shifted slightly. So everything is still on the original property. Um, the restoration that took place with the studio happened in 1993, and it took about a year to complete. And it was just to kind of um, do some maintenance and touch-ups um, within the studio, like seal the, the windows. And then also Charlie liked to paint under the skylight, which you can kind of see um, in this picture as well. Um, he had that installed as well to the studio. And then the other end was kind of a gallery space. So uh, to illustrate just a couple things. So I think this photograph, I've never noticed this before, but this photograph really nicely illustrates how the roof was raised. So you'll see in this picture of Charlie, um, the top of the uh, curtain rod here is nearly at the roof line. And if I go back to this picture, you'll see the roof line is now quite a bit taller. Uh, it's actually four logs taller. So previously that roof line would have been right at the top of this picture here. Um, and now it extends quite a bit higher. So I just wanted to point that out because I've not noticed that in our pictures before. Um, so as Olivia said, this is a picture of, oh gosh, my mouse is very sensitive. Uh, this is a picture of Charlie standing in the studio. This is looking at the Northwest corner of the studio. Um, and you'll see the, the um, restoration project and conservation project that we had in 2017 through 2019, uh, the second such project uh, the museum has undertaken, uh, we tried to return it back to the state it was in when Charlie was painting. You know, we really wanted it to feel to our visitors like Charlie just stepped out that back door to go to the house to have some lunch and he'll be back any minute. So we use a lot of historic photographs to influence and um, inform our decisions. You'll see we have the same painting on the canvas, or excuse me, on the easel here. Uh, we have a lot of the same artifacts on the, um, on the um, shelves. And uh, we, like I said, we really wanted it, people to feel like they were just stepping back in time. Here's some nice historic photos of the exterior of the home, or excuse me, the, the studio originally. Remember Olivia pointed out that the gallery addition was added later. Um, it was hopefully, it, they hoped it would be completed in Charlie's lifetime, but he passed away before that could happen. But these are just some fun pictures, Charlie roping in his front yard. Um, Olivia mentioned Albert Trigg. This is a good old Albert here in the background. Uh, and then of course, Charlie sitting on this wonderful um, front stoop he had. Both of these pictures, again, were taken before the roof was raised. So this is the original lower roof. So we've told you about Charlie, we've told you about the house and studio, we should, we would be remiss if we didn't mention any of his artwork, considering the vast majority of his art created after 1904, 1903, 1904, when the studio was completed, was completed here in this log cabin. He rarely worked elsewhere. He did work a little bit at Bullhead Lodge, um, but his summers were mostly spent entertaining friends and things like that. So he did some pieces up there, but the bulk of his, um, Oove, if you will, is from, from the studio here. So this is a really early work. Um, and I show it not because it was created in the studio. Obviously, it was not. But I think it will allow you to see the progression of his art. So Olivia mentioned Charlie was not a professionally trained artist. Um, he was essentially self-taught. And so his early works, such as Prairie Fire here, and I should mention, all of the artworks I'll be showing you are in the museum's collection. Um, so they are located here um, and they have been donated or purchased um, with museum funds. So the Prairie Fire, um, circa 1898, um, it, it's lovely. It's a little bit dark, especially if you look at some of his later pieces. For example, the Exalted Ruler. Uh, fun fact about Charlie, he was a member of the Elks Lodge. And uh, they asked him to create a painting for them. So this is titled To My Brothers. This is a really large painting. I know it's hard to tell on your screen, but it is um, probably six feet across and four to five feet tall. It's quite large. And um, it really shows an Elks Club 
as an elk herd. So in an elk herd, you of course have the bull elk, the largest, um, strongest elk in the herd. In a, an elk's lodge, you have the president, if you will. Their ceremonial title is the exalted ruler. So you have the current exalted ruler, you have the incoming exalted ruler coming up the hill, head bowed in respect, kind of watching and learning from the exalted ruler. And then you have the previous exalted ruler. He's going down the hill, he's leaving the picture, but he's still very much involved, still sought for counsel, that sort of thing. Another fun thing about Charlie, he was a bit of a jokester. He loved to play games. He loved to entertain people with stories. So he hid things in his paintings. And I know it's hard to see, some of you are probably watching this on your cell phone, but there is a little sage grouse hidden in the, the grass here. I hope you can see that. Um, he's located right there. This is my personal favorite in our collection. Um, it's titled The Fireboat 1918. Again, beautiful colors. Russell really um, embraces and captures the um, Montana sky so beautifully. There's a wonderful song by Ian Tyson. Uh, and at the end of it, he talks about after Charlie dies and goes to heaven, God says to Russell, well, you handle the sunsets and sunrises in Montana because you could do them better than I can. Uh, and I think that just goes to show how wonderfully uh, Russell paints those wonderful Montana skies. Um, Russell was a friend of the Native Americans when he was a cowboy. He um, got to know quite a few and then maintained those friendships for the rest of his life and he tried to depict them in the best light possible, which wasn't always the case with artists working in his day. Uh, and so he created paintings like this, the fireboat. You'll see there are some Native Americans, they are out scouting. Um, this gentleman is signing fire. The Native Americans of the plains had a shared sign language. I'm not sure if you're all aware of that. Um, it, that's a fascinating piece in itself. I encourage you to look it up. But yes, he's signing fire and he's looking at this gentleman here who's then looking down at the river and that's when the viewer sees the steamship and they're looking at this steamship wondering what it is what's going on what it means for the future um so anyway it's a wonderful um painting um has a an interesting story and point behind it on top of that, um, you know, Russell used his artwork to be an advocate for the Native Americans. In particular, he was friends with a man named John Youngboy, who was a member of the Chippewa Cree tribe. They were a non-treaty tribe. They refused to sign a treaty. And there was a band of the Chippewa Cree living here in Great Falls, just across the river where the dump was located. Uh, and that's how they were surviving. They would scavenge the dump and then they would um, create crafts and try to sell those just to survive. Um, Russell knew that and he he was heartbroken by it. So he created quite a few illustrations. This is a fairly early one titled The Last of His Race, which I think says a lot. Um, but you have an elderly Native American here looking rather wistfully at a bison skull. And you see, oh, well, my mouth, mouse got ahead of me, but that's okay. If you look closely in the background of the painting, you'll see that out of the smoke of the smelter is an old bison hunt scene. Again, Charlie is reminding the viewer that there was an incredible culture here before, and they have been decimated by expansion. Um, and it was just something he wanted people to be aware of. Uh, he worked hard in his life to honor and represent the Native Americans as best he could. I shouldn't say represent, um, to honor them and advocate on their behalf. Uh, so he worked with a group of people and they were able to establish the Rocky Boy Reservation in I believe 1916. Um, and that became home for the Chippewa Cree people. Um, and I know I'm flying through this, but I know we're on a time frame. So uh, the next thing I'd like to talk about is Josephine Trigg. I would be absolutely remiss if I did not mention her, mostly because if it were not for Josephine, I would not have a job. Olivia would not have a job. Uh, Josephine Trigg is the woman here, second from the left in the picture. She was Albert Trigg's daughter. She was in similar age to Nancy. They became very close friends. Um, Margaret Trigg, Josephine's mother, took Nancy under her wing. As Olivia said, you know, Nancy had a really rough upbringing and Margaret really taught her how to navigate society. M Nancy was tasked with not only corresponding, but also negotiating with millionaires of the time, which now would be billionaires, you know? Uh, and so Nancy needed to know how to present herself in that world. 
over her life, Josephine and her family um, collected quite a few gifts from the Russells, everything from beautiful oil paintings to um, little sculptures Charlie would create. Josephine was the children's librarian in town, and it would be not uncommon for her to bring a book over to the studio and sit and read to Charlie out loud while he was painting, kind of the audible of the day. Uh, and in return, Charlie would create little sculptures based on those stories. So in our collection at the museum, we have wonderful little sculptures of um, my favorite is Friar Tuck from Robin Hood. Again, little things that Charlie made Josephine based on the books they were reading. He also once stole her copy of A Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court and added watercolor illustrations to the pages of the novel, which I think is just wonderful. So Josephine kept all of these things throughout her life. And when she died, she left them uh, as well as uh, illustrated letters that were written to her family from Charlie and Nancy, and she left them to be uh, created, to have a museum created. Uh, so to this day, Olivia and I work for the Trigg C.M. Russell Foundation. Uh, it started, um, let's see, I'll actually go back to my original slide here. So the original museum, uh, the, the Charlie Russell Museum, was just this little corner right here. That was it. This stood where the Joseph, where the Trig home once stood. And then you did have the Russell Memorial that was run by the city at the time. And these were the two attractions. And then over time, you can kind of actually see in the roof line of the museum where it was expanded into the 70s and then, um, excuse me, in the 60s, the 70s, and then the 90s. Uh, the museum has expanded ever since then. So if it were not for Josephine and certainly Nancy, uh, we may not me uh, here today, we may not know who Charlie Russell was. So I wanted to be sure to include that because we certainly owe a debt of gratitude to them. With that, I wanna make sure we have time for questions and answers. So I will put up this last slide um, with some more information. If you have any additional questions um, that you maybe don't wanna ask in this setting, um, you're welcome to email Olivia or I. Our website has, oh, I forgot to mention the virtual tours. We have virtual tours of the house and studio as well as quite a few of our galleries located on our website. Um, within the studio, there's a wonderful video of the man who created all of the reproductions. Um, and, you know, we show uh, the original piece and then his reproduction in that video. And you, it's truly difficult to tell the difference. He did an incredible job. Um, if I've caught your interest with Charlie Russell and Nancy, here are some wonderful books. Um, if you'd like to purchase them from the museum store, we would certainly be grateful for that. Um, but you can find them wherever books are, well, Amazon, bookshop.org, some of those stores as well. So with that, I want to make sure we have time for questions. I'll turn it back over to Mackenzie. She can kind of facilitate that and we'll go from there. Awesome. Thank you so much, Christine and Olivia. I know there is so many incredible stories, so much artwork and, and so much to discuss around the house. So I really appreciate the survey course that we just got. It was amazing. Um, so uh, as mentioned, this is the Q&A portion of this presentation. So if you have any burning questions or curiosities, please pop those into the Q&A box. Um, I do want to start with my own question, though, a little selfishly. Um, so the home a studio and museum, as you just kind of outlined, are all right next to each other. And I'm curious if you could share just a little bit more about the work that the museum does um, beyond exhibiting uh, Charlie Russell's work, um, other artists that you bring in or other sort of programs that you offer. Sure. So I, I think like most museums, we have our um, legacy galleries, if you will, so our permanent galleries. Those are, of course, the C.M. Russell works, um, the Josephine Trigg Gallery to kind of pay honor to her and that collection. It's a very personal collection, so it does have its own space. Um, in our lower level of our museum, we have an incredible exhibition called The Bison, Heart of the Plains. And it's, I tell people, it's kind of natural history museum meets art museum. Um, and so we take people through the bison from prehistoric times through the Native American times. We have a wonderful wall graphic that shows a bison and then calls out the different parts of the bison and how the Native American people would use it. And then we have artifacts as examples of the ways that they would be used. And then we go all the way into, you know, the 19th and 20th century, the near extermination of the bison, that sort of thing. Um, so we have those as our permanent galleries. We certainly have temporary exhibitions. Um, we put on temporary exhibitions that are based on Charlie Russell, but we also branch out uh, 
two years ago, last year, we had a wonderful exhibition of Andy Warhol, which most oh, cool. people don't think Western art, Andy Warhol, but he has a collection of Western art prints that he created, lithographs. So um, we have Andy Warhol. We have artists of the contemporary West is up right now. And it's different artists who are working today to sort of continue on that tradition of Charlie Russell. One of my favorites is by an artist uh, with the last name of Gogas. I'm sorry, G-O-G-A-S. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we we were asked to give any complicated names in advance, and I did not give that one. Okay. Um, so uh, yes, Gogas and hits um, Picasso meets Charlie Russell. The title of it is "If Charlie and Pablo Had a Drink," and it's a traditional Russell work, but done in the style of Pablo Picasso. So we have all kinds of things in addition to, of course, the house and studio and Russell artworks. That's amazing. So this will lead right into another question just asked. Um, so if uh, folks are planning to come and see the space um, in real life, how much time should one plan to visit both the museum, home, and studio? Sure. Generally, we tell people to allow two to three hours. Um, I've had people fly through the museum in 45 minutes. We've had people come in the morning, leave for lunch, come back and spend the rest of the afternoon. So nice. it really depends on your style of visiting museums, but generally two to three hours is a pretty safe bet. Perfect. Um, so someone wants to know how Russell's work was promoted across the country, so outside of the, the Western region. Sure. Nancy was really instrumental in this early in his career, um, kind of maybe before Nancy, he did a lot of selling of prints to be published in magazines, newspapers. Um, he would illustrate books. If someone was writing a, a Western book, he would create the illustrations for it. That was a big source of income for them. Um, he would sell his pieces to be turned into um, calendars, uh, cigarette, or excuse me, cigar boxes. We have so many cigar boxes in our collection of works, you know, and they're not obviously the originals, but um, he would, he and Nancy would sell that work. And then he did work a little bit with the railroad. That was a way a lot of artists of the time gained notoriety. He wasn't quite as prolific at that as um, say a, a John Ferry or some of the others but he knew quite a few of the railroad people, Louis J. Hill, those types of guys. Um, and that was another way his artwork was promoted. But a lot of it was kind of word of mouth. Um, his exhibitions would, Nancy would arrange for an exhibition to be staged in Minneapolis and later New York. Uh, and there would be write-ups, art critic write-ups. And um, they would, you know, often thankfully to critical acclaim um, and people would sort of hear about it that way. Nice. So a lot of avenues and and where uh, his work was shared widely. Amazing. Um, all right. Someone is wondering um, specifically about an artwork. So in the fireboat, there are illustrations of Native Americans. Um, and are these based on actual people whom Russell saw or knew? Or is this sort of a nostalgic look back? A lot of Russell's artwork depicting Native Americans is before Russell was here in Montana. However, it was not uncommon for him to include the faces of real people that he knew. I can't speak to this artwork in particular, um, but John Youngboy often modeled for Charlie. Josie Wright, who was uh, of Native American descent, would model for Charlie Russell. So if this may not be a direct portrait of them, but people he knew very much influenced what he painted. Gotcha, perfect. Uh, someone else wants to know, how old was Charlie when he passed and um, what was his cause of death, if known? Sure, he was uh, 62 and his, his cause of death generally is heart failure. That's what they say. Um, he died of heart failure, but he was just generally in ill, Ill health. Um, he had a goiter. Um, that he'd been battling for quite some time. He battled appendicitis at one point. Um, it, towards the end of his life, he and Nancy had begun building a home in Pasadena, California, mm -hmm. because the doctors told him, you know, your lungs are bad, your heart is not good. You need to go to a more temperate climate. Maybe the, the sea air in California will help you last a little bit longer. Uh, unfortunately, he, yeah. didn't, he didn't make it much longer, but... Um, so yeah, so heart failure is the official diagnosis. 
Yeah, I would imagine during the time that he's living, it's a hard life on you know the Western Front, no matter what. So absolutely, and he uh, was a cowboy in every sense: hard drinking, smoking. You know, he did stop drinking later in his life. Um, Nancy, Nancy put a stop to that, but he uh, he lived life. We'll say that. <laughs> Um, so uh, one last question, and then I think we'll wrap up. Uh, so someone is wanting to know if there is a library, archive, or study center that uh, visitors have access to on site. We have, uh, we're so lucky to have the Frederick and Ginger Renner Research Center here in the museum. Um, it is closed to the public uh, and by appointment only. So okay. if you are planning a trip to Great Falls and would like to come, just contact um, Olivia would be your best point of contact. Um, let her know you'll be coming and she can arrange for a time for you to access our library and research center. Of course, if there's anything in particular you're curious about, she could help, our, our staff could help pull some of those materials in advance because as you can imagine, it is a research center. So uh, it would be difficult to just sort of peruse. Perfect, awesome, great information to pass along. Um, all right, well, I think I'm going to close this out. Uh, so first off, thank you to everyone for joining us today. We so appreciate your attendance, not only on today's program, but if you've been joining across uh, this road trip, uh, thank you so much for your continued support. Uh, my uh, gratitude, especially for Valerie, Christina, and Olivia today for their time and energy uh, for this presentation. So as I mentioned at the top, um, a recording of today's event will be made available online in the coming weeks. And you can find this presentation and all of this year's presentations and last year's road trip presentations um, on the James Castle House YouTube channel. Um, I will drop links to all this in the chat in just a moment. Um, although we have reached the end of this year's virtual road trip, uh, the adventure need not uh, be done. Uh, I would highly recommend, you can see it here, um, the Guide to Historic Artist Homes and Studios by none other than Valerie Belint. Um, this book is so beautiful. It features the majority of uh, the Haas member sites and is really just an incredible resource for those that want to dig deeper and uh, plan, plan your own road trip. Valerie, while I drop links into the chat, is there anything you want to add about this book or about um, Haas programming? Um, it is our hope, I believe I can say this, Mackenzie, to do this again next year. Um, and feedback is welcome. We continue to hone it. But I just am always so grateful to uh, the staff at these sites who volunteer, volunteer their time and their expertise to um, take us on these wonderful virtual adventures. And I would just say, um, I never thought in my life I would go to Great Falls, Montana, which means you can too. So go to the book and figure it out and um, don't let um, go in a place in your own backyard, but don't be afraid to set, venture out in more foreign parts because it is so incredibly well worth it. I will never forget my trip to Great Falls and would urge everyone to find a way to get there. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Valerie. Thank you, Christina and Olivia. Thank you, Lavona, for interpreting today. And thanks to all of you. And uh, we'll hopefully see you next year. Thanks, all. Bye. Bye.